Okay, well, we had a lot of good questions there. Um, I'm not sure we finished with the, where'd he go? I'm not sure we finished with the questions about wavelength modulation spectroscopy, but maybe that helped. Um, now laser-induced fluorescence, which probably most of you know all about, and I'm preaching to the choir. But I have a picture, I have a picture I, I can guarantee you have never seen. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the basic equations, talk about uh, short pulse LIF, calibrated LIF, planar laser-induced fluorescence, and then PLIF with fuel tracers. So LIF is a resonant technique, it's spatially resolved, pulsed for combustion applications usually, linear technique, scales with the irradiance, used mostly in the visible and ultraviolet spectral regimes. I think on the first day I explained that if you try to do it in the infrared, there's so much background radiation it can, it can hinder what you're trying to do. That's the nice thing about the ultraviolet, all that thermal radiation, you know, Planck kind of stuff is gone. Often it's narrow bandwidth. It's a background free technique and you gotta love those. It's difficult to make it quantitative, but you can do that. So I showed a picture similar to this before, but now I'm gonna complicate it a little bit. So what we're, we're looking again at a molecule in the X state and in the A state, and we talked yesterday all about what causes these structures, okay? Now we're gonna tune a laser, process A, we're gonna have the laser absorbed going from this lower level up to that excited state. Once it's in the A state, it can stay for a moment because there is a fixed uh, fluorescence lifetime. During that, uh, what? Uh, we're talking, um, yeah, hundreds of picoseconds, nanoseconds, something like that. Depends on the molecule and how much pressure you've got on it, that kind of thing. I don't know that number exactly, but it is published somewhere. It's, it's, just, it's just one over the Einstein coefficient for the line you're looking at. That's the natural lifetime of the... Is it a probabilistic thing, like after so many nanoseconds, half of them have decayed, or is it after... It, it, in, the question is, is it a probabilistic lifetime in the sense that it's a half-life or something like that? Yeah, they don't all suddenly cascade down. In fact, we talked about rate equations. We're going to talk about rate equations again in a minute. It's, it's a rate equation solution you can take with an A coefficient in it. Yeah, you know, that's one thing. We were talking to, among the, uh, among the faculty the other night, we were talking to each other about these kind of things. And I'm not, I guess, I'm not like a wild detailed person. I can't remember exact numbers for things so much. I, I, it's like I'm not going to worry about that. I'm busy figuring out other things, and I know I can find that number in the book somewhere, so sometimes I'll forget a number, like what's the, a, what's the A coefficient for OH? I should know that. I did used to know that, but, you know, I like, I allow my brain to eject those things because I want to learn some new, <laughs> I want to understand some model or something like that, so I don't worry about remembering them because those are the things I know I can find in a book. But, uh, yeah, the, the other faculty think I should know all those numbers, so I apologize. <laughs> I don't... Anyway, during that excited state lifetime, other things can happen. And one of the things that happens is it's redistributed across uh, vibrational rotational levels up in the A state. So we get what we call a, an upper manifold. There's a whole collection of these uh, states that are populated once we've uh, pumped, the laser, pumped the molecule up there. Once it's up there, though, it can also give off energy to collisions. We talked about that. That's called collisional quenching. It just has to have a collider molecule. And they don't actually have to collide with each other. They just, they, a near miss can cause it to, to lose its energy. But the molecules remaining in the A state, okay, can relax back to the X state, giving off light, which is process C. The point being here, if you look at that picture, you can have lots of transitions. So there's not just one emission line from the A state, there is actually a lot of emission lines from the A state, even though you pump just one line. So people can take advantage of that process. You can separate the LIF spectrum from Rayleigh scattering, right? You really don't want to have to stare at the laser wavelength. There, the laser can scatter off of surfaces. It'll Rayleigh scatter. If there are even little particles around, it'll be scattering. You don't want to look at the laser wavelength. You can, you can uh, put a bandpass filter in front of the camera if you're doing PLIF. 
uh, and look at a different band. So one thing that's popular is to pump uh, a line in the zero one band, right? That's a vibrational band uh, and detect in a completely different vibrational band because thanks to this energy transfer in the excited state, that will happen. So that's a good way to get rid of some noise. Fluorescence quantum yield is usually pretty low and when you do PLIF you typically have to use an intensified camera so that uh, you'll be able to see it. We were just talking about uh, uh, the old-fashioned way of doing things. Um, people initially made LAF measurements at single point mm -hmm. as shown here. It wasn't really single point, there was a sample volume defined by the lens and the laser beam, but it was close to being a single point. You can still use those, uh, that approach if you want to study a spectrum, and we were just talking about that. There's actually, um, I, I, when I, now that we talked about it, I realize I haven't seen this in a long time, but in the 80s and the 90s, people used to do detailed studies of spectra, and it was part of how they learned where do we want to look, if we want to look at temperatures and things like that. They would study the spectrum, and they would do it this way, they would scan the laser, that was called an excitation spectrum, and then, then they would look at the, the fluorescence spectrum as a function of when they pumped and so forth. Uh, and in fact, I, uh, I once had a visit to the University of Bielefeld in Germany where we used a very short pulse laser and we had a streak camera. A streak camera is very fast, it'll, it'll, it has resolution on the order of picosecond. So in, with a streak camera along one axis you'd have the wavelength and then in the streak you'd look at the lifetime of the molecule, right, in the different lines and things like that. And you could actually watch how it would populate one region and then lose population and so on. And, and people used to get very, very nice spectra doing that kind of work, but for some reason I haven't seen that since about, since the end of the 1900s. It's possible to make LAF more quantitative if you measure the quenching partners with something like Raman scattering, for example. People have done that. I'll show you an example of, of that kind of work when I talk about Raman scattering tomorrow. So let's do a little bit about the basic equations, and again we use this oversimplified two-level model. When we talked about the uh, equation of radiative transfer, we talked about these rate equations here. This is how people typically analyze LIF, or at least they used to in the late 70s and in the 80s. And that's what all these things are. We'll just go back there. This is the uh, population of the M state. This is the rate of the excitation from the M state. This is the population of the upper state. De-excitation rate, stimulated, spontaneous, and quenching. It's common to assume that uh, the upper state is in steady state. And why is that? It's because, um, you know, a, a YAG laser, a, a dye laser pulse from pumped by a YAG laser, the pulse will come up and look like that, right? What the argument is that, that these state-to-state uh, -state transitions are so fast, they will just keep up with this pulse. And so at any one point in that pulse, that we'll just assume that everything is at steady state. That We used to do that to try to make things simpler. Then you could just say this, that the excited state population is given by that. And, and so this is, this is the rate at which we populate it, that's the absorption rate, and that's a, that's a loss rate. Hmm. You know, so those molecules, once they've been pumped up there, emit into four pi stair radians, okay? So the number of photons per unit volume per second is gonna be given by that. The number times the rate at which they're emitted. And then this is the uh, uh, power per unit volume, that's the energy per photon, right? So we use those expressions. So to get the total number, that, that's per, uh, fo for, per uh, molecule to get the total number, we have to take the uh, uh, density times the volume, and, and so you get that. So you end up with this expression for the fluorescence uh, yield, it was called. So that's the fluorescence signal given by these terms here, and, and this omega over 4 pi is the fraction of the total emission. This thing is going to emit in a, in a torus you know, all over the laboratory. And, uh, and so we're only going to collect part of it. That's the fraction of it that we're collecting. And people used to use this uh, kind of an expression in the past to, well, for example, uh, I had a friend who was one of the very early adapters of planar laser-induced fluorescence imaging, and, and he had an, an analysis that people liked a lot where 
he would, he would talk about you know, the camera chip. That's a cool thing about optics, in case you were never taught that. Optics can go two directions. So in this case, now we can talk about the camera chip. You can actually, in your mind, or on a piece of paper, map that over into the flame by going through the optics. Then now this chip's over here, and he did a really nice model of, per pixel, how much signal do we expect to get? How much are we going to lose? Magnification, demagnification, so on. What's the signal level? It was a really nice, I mean, it wasn't accurate, but it was a way to look at uh, what's the best way to improve the quality of this signal? Because everything, he mapped everything from the object plane to the image plane, including production of the signal itself, which was a really nice way to be able to sit down and say, I think I need to boost this because that's the most important thing. So, and this is how people did that. So the fluorescence uh, signal would be given by the system efficiency, the photons absorbed per second, the fluorescence yield, and the fraction collected. It's possible to get a decent estimate of V if you measure the beam diameter and you work out the overlap of the collection optics doing exactly what I just described. You, you start from the sensor and, and map it forward into the flame. That tells you how big the sample volume is. Yes? Do you remember the name of that paper and the author? Do I remember the name of that paper and the author? Actually, <laughs> uh, he never actually published it. He would, he would present that when he would go talk to people. And <laughs> It, it was a funny situation where uh, he had it all written out on a piece of paper on the desk and, and when, he, when he left the talk he smashed it up and threw it away and some people ran down to the garbage can and <laughs> pulled it out. <laughs> Phil was like that. But, uh, I won't tell any stories. <laughs> Maybe tonight if you want to hear a story about Phil Paul. The quenching rate is a little tough. Uh, it depends on the collision rates and so forth. Uh, there was a paper done in the 1980s by uh, Rob Barlow. Maybe some of you have heard of him. He's the guy who runs the turbulent non premix flame workshop. He did a nice paper on what's known about quenching rates and sort of bundled them together in a, in a formalism that allows you to make a decent estimate of what's the quenching rate based on m knowledge of what the quenching partners are. So if you, need to, if you need to do that, look up Rob Barlow's papers and look in the 80s and see what you can find. When we do experiments, uh, we're actually involving a lot of energy levels. That equation I just showed you is for two levels, which is extremely, uh, it's useful. You can look at it and understand the physics behind what's happening, but it's not realistic. The only case I know of where you can actually model everything, you know, I was talking about the fact that you can, you can pump in the, in the zero one and detect in the zero zero. How do you model all of that energy transfer and emission? It turns out there is one place where they do that, uh, the University of Bielefeld has this code called LASKIN. I don't, I don't know if they've ever shared it with anybody, but you might be able to talk them into it. Um, it's like a chemical kinetics code, but instead of doing chemical kinetics, it uses the, the photon interactions and all of the energy transfer within the excited state and the ground state and so forth. And so you can like model the spectral behavior. And I know they have it for OH. Um, and I think they have it partially finished for other molecules like NO as well. So that's the only place I know of where people try to do detailed modeling of all of this that goes on. Saturated fluorescence, well, uh, we talked about saturation in lecture two. You have to use very high laser intensity to, to uh, uh, drive the, the stimulated rate. It wants to dominate over everything else and then you get a different expression. It's not possible to, okay, I, it's not possible to, to absolutely saturated transition, although you can make it behave like a saturated transition. And it's because there will be these places where you, you, get, you fall below the saturation limit. Picosecond, you can use picoseconds. Uh, there's, there are different regions of uh, um, pulse widths. And, and in the picosecond regime, pico is 10 to the minus 12. The, we haven't said this yet, but uh, there is a uh, time bandwidth uh, product. It's a Fourier transform between the two. So if you want a short pulse, you have to have very broad bandwidth. If you want uh, a narrow band pulse, you have to have a very long pulse. How, wait, did I say that right? Very short pulse has to have very broad bandwidth. Uh, if you want narrow bandwidth, you have to have a broad pulse. 
So in the picosecond regime, you end up with a bandwidth that, that sort of is, is just a little bit bigger than a normal absorption profile. So that's kind of nice. It's, it's good for spectroscopy. So here's a case where uh, if you tune one of those things, and this is from Bielefeld, this work, you can, uh, you can hit one line. The trouble with the femtosecond things is you could accidentally hit lots of lines. This can hit one line, so you tune that to where you want it. Here's the pulse. And then you can, you, if you have a fast enough detector, notice that this is uh, 3,000 picoseconds out here, so it has to be pretty fast. Um, if you have a fast enough detector, you can catch this decay. And that decay actually is the quenching rate in the environment that you happen to be operating at that point. So it do, you don't have to know now what, who the colliders were because you've actually just measured Q. But the other thing is, uh, if you extrapolate this curve up to when the pulse hit, that's a quench-free LIF measurement. So that helps. You can just get rid of Q by doing that, but you need a picosecond laser. They aren't that hard to come up with now. You can also calibrate LIF. People calibrate lots of different ways. Uh, engine people, they, will, they like to use fuel tracers, and so what they will do is they will just feed a known amount of fuel tracer into an engine without firing it. That's just called motoring the engine, right? So it'll compress the mixture, it'll give you a, a realistic pressure and temperature, and then you take a measurement there, you know exactly how much of the tracer you put in there, and so you can change the conditions in the chamber, the pressure, the temperature, the uh, concentration of the tracer, and make a full calibration matrix. That's quite common. Here's something that we did in Colorado. We calibrated LIF with cavity ring down spectroscopy. Uh, and it doesn't look great, I realize that. Here's the flame equivalence ratio. Here's the OH concentration, but it's an absolute measurement of concentration. Um, and then, so let's look at this. We were looking at three different lines, okay, uh, in cavity ring down spectroscopy. And the green line is LIF, okay. And then the gray area is actually, uh, that code called premix, which is part of ChemKin. So premix isn't all that great by itself. I mean, this is, this is like looking at all the serious errors that are involved in these things and trying to be honest as possible about it. So the LIF was calibrated only at phi equals 0.96. So we calibrated, so that would be that one there. We calibrated LIF with uh, uh, these ring down measurements and then compared LIF to the ring down measurements into uh, the, uh, the premix code, and you see that the calibrated LIF tends to follow the, the trends of, of the code and the ring down, except for up here. And that's why we calibrated over here. Let's see, do I talk about that somewhere? Yeah, the uncertainties are caused by flame fluctuation and temperature uncertainties. Um, the calibrated LIF would agree with premix fairly well, but uh, cavity ring down had a problem over here because of other hydrocarbons. That's, that's uh, something you don't see so much with LIF when, when you're sending the cavity. This is, the cavity ring down is an extremely sensitive measurement, and it started to run into other absorbers when, we, when it went rich. So if you end up wanting to use cavity ring down spectroscopy to calibrate LIF, you should do it lean, because then the, uh, the things that interfere with your calibration will be reduced. Well, you can see these uncertainties here, they're fairly big, so that's uh, uh, from 3,000 up to uh, 4,500 in a measurement of about uh, 3,500, 3, 3,750, so that's fairly big. But that's because we, we didn't really have a good handle on the temperature, and if you don't have a good handle on it, we just measured it with uh, uh, radiation-corrected thermocouples, which are not really reliable, and uh, so the problem there is you're looking at Boltzmann fractions that are swinging all over the place when you change temperature like that. So if you really wanted to get this nailed, you'd have to measure temperature in a more uh, robust way, like with cars or something like that, or, or use a thing where the temperature is much better known. So anyway, the, these uncertainties are high because of the temperature uncertainty. Other questions? OK, PLIF. That's the very first PLIF image ever shown. I, knew, I told you I was going to have something you've never seen before. That's from 1982. Uh, and the authors are George Kichikov, uh, Rob Howe, and Ronald K. Hansen. 
And, and I was in exactly that laboratory when that happened. Uh, but I'm not on the list, and, and I wasn't really part of it. I wasn't, I wasn't involved in this. So actually, I, I was thinking about it today, since we, since we seem to have time. You know, the, some of the instructors and I were talking at breakfast this morning. All of us seemed to be ending our lectures a little bit early, and then we realized that our lectures were all created for Tsinghua, and the, the, they actually had slightly shorter periods in Tsinghua, which is why we keep kind of ending up with a little more time. So I have a little bit more time. In a minute, I'll talk about Cliff, but I thought, well, since we have time, what was I doing in the corner of the lab while he was doing that? <laughs> well, what I did is uh, I used fiber optics to do spectroscopy with. And, and I thought, well, maybe I should mention that. I mean, it's for some reason, I, just, I always forget about that because it's like, yeah, so what? But uh, uh, the idea with fiber optics is that you can go into something that's enclosed. You don't have to have big windows, right? So I did two things. One was with a, I had one fiber that came in. And see, these things, you don't just stick fibers in a flame, right? Because fibers are actually made by flames, which means that it'll change its shape if you get it hot. So it has to be inside a cooled probe which is an unfortunate aspect of it. But anyway, there's a fiber optic here inside a cooled probe, staring at another fiber optic inside a cooled probe. And you make sure these things are separated enough so that they're not disturbing so much the flow that you're trying to study. And then I used a, uh, a ring dye laser, like we were just discussing, that was frequency doubled to look at OH just by scanning across the line and measuring the uh, concentration. But I only did that in one location because I used that to calibrate LIF. And so the way that I did LIF was this. So here's a, a cooled probe body. So this, this, is just a, this was a small, small tube that had cooling water in it. And, and actually, you, you put hot water from the building through there because then you don't get condensation on it. You don't want it to be too cold, right? And so then there was a small tube on the outside of that that was oven braised to it that had a fiber optic in it, right? And so this fiber optic just sent pulsed light out there into the flame. And you want to get far enough away so that this thing is not disturbing what you're trying to look at. And then over here, I had another tube housing that just had a mirror. And there was a fiber optic right there that would collect the signal that was bounced into it. And in those days, you could not get micro optics. Uh, so I just sort of lived with the, the bad collection properties. But if you think about it, nowadays you can get micro optics. You could, put a, you could put an optic here that will actually collect that better because that's a flat mirror. It, we just, it was just a polished piece of platinum. You just get somebody to polish a little piece of platinum at the angle you need and mount it out there. And th this whole thing would glow red, but it wouldn't move. And so you just collect the LIF signal. And so it was calibrated with that, uh, that other fiber optic. So it was inside a, a, a combustion tunnel that w didn't have windows on it. So you could, you, and you could move this around. It was calibrated in one place. You could move this around and make measurements of OH, point measurements all around the, the thing. So that's what I was doing on the other side of the lab while George was doing this. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a, a McKenna burner. And in those days, you know, the cameras were just not so good. Uh, it was ultraviolet, so I was around 300 nanometers. I just did it quickly. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was his name? There was a, we, we did an experiment. We, there was a guy, I forget who, who, who used to like advertise Timex watches. John Cameron Swayze. He used to he's like put, he would put a Timex watch on the, on the prop of a motorboat and stick it in, like, you know, and then the thing was still working. And so we called this one experiment the John Cameron Swayze experiment. George and I, George ran the lasers when I used this thing in the, in the combustor. And uh, we were, it was like 1.30 in the morning. And for some reason, I don't know why, George had put an extra valve on the cooling water. And I didn't know it was there. And so it's like 1.30 in the morning and, and uh, we start the whole thing up. That valve was still off. My beautiful probe was in this thing. 
smoke coming out everywhere. <laughs> George, George yelling at me that he doesn't see any signal anymore. And <laughs> well, anyway, we called it the John Cameron Swayze experiment because when, when we shut everything off, the thing was still working. The, the probe was still working. <laughs> Light still coming out. So anyway. All right, so sorry. Um, yeah, it was very hard to get a, a, a low light, light level camera um, that, that would uh, measure these kind of things in those days. So you can see it's highly pixelated. It doesn't have very good spatial resolution. So actually, that, that was with a, a quant array uh, pumping a dye laser with what they called a wavelength extender. And really, the technology hasn't changed much. If you have a quant array in your laboratory, it's probably not much different. So really, what's changed the most is the cameras. And then, of course, there are high-speed lasers now that make uh, even higher speed measurements possible. So planar, we talked about it before. How do you make a plane? You spread it into a sheet with uh, cylindrical optics and spherical optics. And then the camera views it at 90 degrees to the plane. Cliff cameras have to be able to see low light levels. So you use an image intensifier, which is the most common thing to do, or back illuminated CCD. Or I really like these electron multiplying CCDs if you can get one. They have really nice spatial resolution and they're fairly robust. High speed images end up using an intensifier though. So here's a clip, you know, I've already shown you this. It's a classic PLIF picture from the University of Lund with uh, green as acetone and red as OH. I'm not going to show you much more PLIF because everybody has seen PLIF. It's uh, something that everybody does. So I thought I'd talk a little bit more about uh, other applications. But it was, you know, when, when people first started to produce these images, it was really, really cool. And uh, I think probably there are people in this room that don't even know where PLIF started. And uh, that's part of the reason why I wanted to show you that picture. But I think it's actually a good sign. I mean, when something gets to be so good that people don't even remember where it came from, that's a sign that that was a really good thing, a really good thing to demonstrate. Fuel tracers. Uh, if we want to see, uh, when, a lot of times when we study sprays, and sprays are my thing, um, you want to be able to see where's the vapor, where's the liquid, how is this thing behaving itself. And for example, for, there's this technique called a spray-guided direct injected spark ignited engine. Uh, and and spray-guiding means that the spray is supposed to create an ignitable fuel-air mixture at a particular point in time at the spark plug. And that's actually a bit of a problem, so this is a study of that. So we want to see the spatial variation of equivalence ratio. Uh, Normal hydrocarbon fuels that we would use uh, fluoresce very strongly, uh, but they're very broadband in both liquid and vapor forms. So you, get r you can get really confused about uh, what's liquid, what's vapor, and so forth. So that's not a convenient marker. So what we wanted to know was, where's the vapor? Where can we ignite this thing? And so we did this study inside a high pressure and high temperature uh, spray research chamber so that we could do these kind of detailed measurements without having this thing shaking and banging and moving all over the place. So as an alternative, we used uh, uh, some pure hydrocarbons mixed as a surrogate fuel and we chose hydrocarbons that don't fluoresce. And then we chose three different fluorescent tracers mixed into the surrogate fuel. And so this is an example from a friend of mine uh, at uh, Chalmers. So this is the gasoline that they used. So the components were these in these volume percents, and those are the boiling points for those, and that was meant to imitate a gasoline, but it doesn't fluoresce. And then they added these tracers one at a time. So they had this, but they took 5% out and put in 5% of this. So acetone is meant to be a tracer for the low boiling point fuel, okay? So this, they removed 5% of the cyclopentane and put in 5% of acetone, so now they can look at how does the, high boiling, or the low boiling point fuel behave itself in this spray, right? Then they went to 3-pentanone, which is uh, sort of medium. So you pull out isooctane and put in 5% oh, 3-pentanone. And then this meth methylcyclohexanonane uh, for the, uh, the high boiling point fuels. So you could see where are these things landing as a function of pressure and temperature and so forth. 
So the injector is what's called a piezo-actuated hollow cone injector. Uh, the only thing to know about that, if you don't know what that is, it actually it just makes a cone-shaped spray. Okay, so it comes out in the shape of a cone. It's, uh, there are some manufacturers who use direct injected gasoline now. Mostly they're German, like BMW and Daimler. They use this kind of injector. Most uh, engines don't use these because these are more expensive. So the first thing we did was, or I didn't do it, uh, Mats and uh, Jonas did it, but uh, the idea was to look at PIV and see how this thing behaves. Now notice, first of all, that there is no PIV, this is the tip of the holocone spray, there is no PIV up here because they knew enough not to try to do PIV in a place where it's optically thick. So down here it was optically thin, the, uh, the colors represent density of droplets, and you can see what's going on here, and it makes sense if you think about it. You have this, you have this sheet coming out like this. There are going to be shear layers on both sides of that sheet, and they're going to cause roll-ups. Seems kind of obvious in hindsight, right? So there's, there's a roll-up. Here's a little roll-up on the inside. Same thing over here, a little roll-up and a big roll-up. Okay, now we look at uh, me scattering and planar laser-induced fluorescence imaging. Now, these images did not use slippy. And so they suffer from something which is very common, which is that the laser light came from this side and went that way. This one scatters so much of the laser light out of the sheet that this one uh, doesn't get much laser light, which is why it looks weaker. It was actually a symmetric spray. This is a very common thing that happens unless you use slippy. Uh, so that's me scattering. That's, that comes just from droplets. And then this is LIF. That comes from droplets and from vapor. So what you have to do is compare the, the scattered light from the fluorescent light and where, where there is no scattered light but there is fluorescent light, that means there's vapor there. And so if you look at this, there's actually a lot of vapor is ending up collecting inside the vortex, which makes sense if you think about it because if you look at it, you know, this vortex is going like this and rolling up that way, right? So this is where the gas is hot. So the, these things are coming down around that way and sweeping a lot of vapor into the center of that, which is bad news for the spark plug because it's hard to get at that, right? So this is for the light end. So this is the acetone. This is for the heavy end tracer, right? So you look here, you can see there's a lot of vapor being produced. Down here, those are identical. There is no vapor produced. So now you can figure out, okay, what part of the fuel is forming the vapor cloud that we're interested in. Yeah, so the light end vaporized and, uh, and the vapor was pulled into the vortex core under the same conditions the heavy end didn't vaporize. Um, the placement of that vapor has a big effect on cycle to cycle variability, which that's one of the biggest problems facing spray guided direct injected engines is this cycle to cycle variability problem. They also did experiments. I'm not a big believer in, in using uh, laser ignition like for a real motor of some kind, but for an experiment like this, you can actually just place a spark in different locations and, and figure out what happens when the spark is in that, that location. And, I, and they did do that as well. So here the me image is scaled and subtracted from the LIF image, and now you can sort of see the green is there's zero difference between the two images. Orange means the LIF was stronger, and blue means that the droplets are stronger. So blue means droplets, orange means vapor, and green means nothing. So you can, you can look at this, and so you, you look at the three different uh, tracers. This is the light end, the medium, and the heavy end at different uh, temperatures, and you can see that even at the lowest temperature, we're able to vaporize the light ends, but it's landing in the vortex. Way down here at 200 C, you start to see something from the heavy end, but it's also landing in the vortex. So the next topic will be lasers, so why don't we take a 15-minute break. <laughs>